Hello, everybody, and welcome to Gem Cutting Conversations. Uh, my name is Justin K. Prim, and I'm going to be your host this evening. This is the first episode, the first of a, new, a brand new series. So I want to thank all you guys for being here. This is going to be the new monthly series from IGT, where we're going to have some time on Sundays to talk to gem cutters from all over the world, uh, hearing about their stories, learning about their techniques, their tools, their technology, cutting styles, and really any place else that the conversation wants to go. So thanks for being here tonight um, to help me kick it off and uh, have a really fun chat tonight. We're going to be talking with Meg Berry. So uh, just to give a small introduction, Meg was a professionally trained American gem cutter, a self-taught carver. She's a cutting teacher. She's won 10 Spectrum Awards. She does amazing, amazing work, and she is just a very, very fun and cool lady. So we are going to have a really nice conversation tonight, and um, you guys are welcome to throw any questions into the Q&A, and we'll, I'll just pop those in as we go along. But um, I guess without anything else to say, we can just get started. So Meg, if you're ready, come on in and we will get going here. Good here morning. Are. Good morning. Hi. Happy Sunday. Do I, do I get to see it too? Oh, there we go. Hi. There you go. We're here. No. Nope. Hi. No, because I'm moving and that isn't. No. Nope. But, uh, is it look, everything looks normal? What? Well, my picture isn't moving. Do you, does it look normal to you? Yeah, I see you. Okay, am I moving? Yeah. <laughs> okay, hitting. all right. Good. I can't hitting. see what the camera sees, but you can go ahead and talk to me. Oh, right, maybe you need to swipe left or right. I think swipe, swipe. right. And there's like, a, or maybe the other way. Okay, I'm good okay. now. Okay, cool, cool. Welcome. So you're in, you're all the way in California, 14 hours around the world for me here in Bangkok. So how's it going? I, it's I, meant, good. To, it's, I meant to ask you before, are you in, are you in smoke right now? Cause I've been seeing so many photos of San Francisco in, in a cloud of red. Well, I'm, I'm 500 miles from that fire, but there is a huge fire in San Diego County that I haven't seen the actual sun in more than a week. The sky is gray, but um, that fire is under control and it's going to be out soon and the weather's kind of moist and cool today. So I think we're good with fires okay. for now. So for where you're at, good weather. So maybe before we, before we get too deep into who you are and what you're doing, maybe just tell us where you're at right now because I, I think it's, it'll be kind of interesting for our conversation um, about cutting. Uh, where I'm at physically or yeah. in my oh, work? Physically, or Physically, yeah. In physically? The Oh, I'm, I'm in my studio. Oh, this is where I work. This is where I spend oh, pretty much every waking hour. Um, my home is a rock house that was built before the Civil War in Southern California on the side of a mountain in a granite quarry. So I'm pretty much surrounded by rocks from head to toe, um, which works for me. I've been here over 20 years and uh, I build up this little studio and I, I cut, I cab, I carve. Anything you want done to a stone, I can do it here for you. Yeah. So have you been spending a ton of time in there since since the pandemic began? You know, it really actually duplicated my previous lifestyle. I get out to exercise, but I bought a rowing machine. So I've been rowing inside and I ride my bike. But yeah, I have a lot fewer excuses about getting to work. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, I need to run to. No, I don't need to run to anywhere, do I? No. Um, so yeah, I have been getting more work done. I, I've been enjoying it actually. I don't tell anyone, but I like it like this. Well, don't tell anyone. Let's, but, let's but, just wrap. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you just give fewer us? A, yeah, exactly. Fewer distractions. So maybe just give us a little bit of your history. You know, as a as a professional American cutter, maybe how did you get to this point, or or how did you get to this point way back in the day? Well, it all started in 1975. <laughs> I moved to LA in 74 and I had a little background making jewelry. I'd cut a few jade cabs and my main 
job skill was bicycle mechanic and I was riding my bike to a jewelry supply store and they had a sign on the front, learn to facet $50 for six lessons. And it was 1975 and 50 bucks was a month's rent then. And I saved it up and I went and I took six lessons and I sold my first stone for 50 bucks and bought the next six lessons. And by that time, the guy took me on as an apprentice. His name was Bob Livingston and he was a master faceter since the 50s. And he was a principal in the MDR Corporation. And he took me on for three years and I ended up working at the rock shop, which is Breger's Incorporated, which was one of the biggest rock shops in the country at the time. And I went to GIA by correspondence through the 70s. And by 1978, I was working downtown LA as a cutter at the Stone House for Max Schuster, working in the trade, finding out exactly how much of a sweatshop job it could be. Mm -hmm. And then one thing led to another, and I ended up in Carlsbad, California in 1980. Uh, and I opened my own little store called Mega Gem in Carlsbad on State Street, which is now a huge metropolitan <laughs> district but I was right down the street from the Grieger store and they referred customers to me and I was faceting on my own professionally since 1980 with no boss and no nothing and then I worked a few places I had my shop in a jewelry store a mega gem lasted two years and I figured out that all the work I was doing didn't involve walking customers so I kind of closed the door but I worked in a jewelry store in Escondido. I had my cutting shop there, Audison's, until Mr. Audison retired after 31 years. And then I eventually ended up in the 80s working for Bill Larson at Paula International. And that's epic. I haven't been an actual employee since 2020 because I decided, or the year 2000, it's 2020 now. Year 2000, I decided I wanted to pursue carving. I'd been talking about carving for 20 some years and everyone, that knew me well enough to get in my face said if you want to carve just carve quit talking about it so i put my money where my mouth was in the year 2000 and i i quit to carve but meantime you know you still have to pay the bills so i i still cut i still cut for paula i cut for a couple i facet for a, a few private clients and that's it and i've been carving ever since and it's a learning curve i'm climbing it i love a challenge but I've taught myself everything I know about carving. Mostly I stole ideas from other people. I spied on their equipment. I go to museums, look at their technique, look at pictures, look at their work, study everybody's work. You know, and there are a lot of, a lot of major influences in the carving business, you know, from China for the last 5,000 years and Europe, Germany. And then we get to America and all these people that have, have major skills. I'm not gonna name any names because I respect every single one of them and I'll leave someone out but yeah. everybody in the carved world has helped me and has inspired me and if they didn't do it voluntarily they still did it i still stole their ideas so um but i try not to be a copycat i try to have a synergy of my own designs and my own work and i think i've managed that fairly well um but i'm still a student and i'm still struggling every single curve i cut i feel could be better <laughs> and so the next one hopefully is going to be better but your carvings, but, you know, your carvings have won quite a few of the Spectrum Awards, right? They've won three of the last four carving competitions. I've gotten two firsts and a third, but those are the actually the only carving Spectrums I've gotten. And I've, I've entered quite a few carvings over the years, and and that's how I learned. I got one, back, I get them back, and you know, when you get a Spectrum entry back, at first you go, it was rigged, and then you go, so what? learn from it you didn't win it's you know there's luck is as much as anything once your work is good enough but the first carvings i entered really weren't good enough and mm -hmm. i learned from that and i put it back on the polishing wheel and you know learned all about how to create a competition finish that right there if you have good rough a decent design and a competition finish you're you're there you know then it's then that's where the luck <laughs> kicks in um it's great it's wonderful to win a spectrum it's terrible to lose a spectrum but you know if you don't get over it by the next day it's gonna cripple your life so then you know i have 10 spectrum awards you know how many entries i've had mm -mm. 50 maybe or more okay. you know it doesn't just come every time you enter so um, you're not, obviously you're not gonna one, win if you don't enter but if you don't enter you'll never win one yeah exactly so the more you enter and the more you learn the more you learn, that's right. And then every so often you're 
bubble rises to the top and it's fine. Yeah. But it makes the ones you do win much more precious because, you know, I can't say, well, this is the one, this is the piece I'm going to win Spectrum with this year because it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I've done that before and uh, yeah, yeah, I still have the pieces. That so let's go, let's go all the way back to the beginning. You were saying that you, you know, you did a three year apprenticeship. What was that like? That was in the seventies, right? So what, what was the world of yeah. fashion like in the seventies anyway, in, ter in terms of machines and, and what were people using at that time? Okay. The machines that I learned on were the MDR. And since the man who owned the school owned a, had an ownership in MDR, we were a little prejudiced, but he made everyone who was serious about cutting learn on an ultra tech also. And those were the two good machines then. The only other machine we really knew about was the Sapphire, which is a fine machine, but you know, you can only stock so many machines. Griegers carried both the Ultratech and the MDR. They could sell you the machine. Crystalite was making laps and Jack Greenspan still owned it. Um, you know, Crystalite's been the standard for plated laps forever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was an MDR, which hasn't changed that much from the MDR I use right now, which this one was built in 2004. Can you see it? Yeah. I'll show it closer later. But the basic structure is there. It's a very basic machine. You know, you can attach a digital readout, um, but it's not the kind of machine you would want to use for with angle stops and digital readout for the um, meat point style faceting or following GemCAD. I cut my stones to the stone. Mm. You know, I'm fully studied on optics. I, you know, it's very important to me to make the optics work, but Every cut is unique and every cut is just for that stone. Um, this is, I keep notes when I'm cutting. This is my notes on a sapphire that I cut twice for somebody. And this okay. is what I'm working on now. There's that a bicolor, another yeah. bicolor, uh, um, indicolite. And I just make notes of what I'm doing so I can go back and polish. Um, you know, and then I cross stuff out and I do it again. And yeah, this looks so, familiar. Um, I have 45 books full of those sketches. I've, I've chronicled every single stone I've cut since 1979. Okay, and there's over 12,000 stones and I can give you the starting weight, the finished weight, the dimensions wow. of 12,000 stones. Okay. And GIA is our my books, but they only got the first five because it's a pretty big job and they changed librarians over the interim from Donna to Robert. And um, so anyway, yeah, that's what I tell my students. If you don't archive your work, nobody's going to because you're not going to be important for at least 20 years. Yeah. And until then, <laughs> you're only important to yourself. So keep track of what you do. And then everybody I teach puts it on a piece of scratch paper and throws it in the trash can when they're done. And they go, wow, I wish I had that info. Because you can call me and you can say, you recut a sapphire for me in 1982. What was the finished weight on that? And if you're willing to wait, I can find out. Especially yeah. if you give me a date because the books are in order. I can go in the safe and dig out that date for you. Jeez. Derek. Hi, Derek. That's a good, that's a good collection of, of notes. So, okay. You so can, you, you can, borrow, you okay. could work, you could work on a lot of math as far as yield, weight yield from 45 years of cutting, Yeah. you know, lifetime average close to 35%. Um, or, or, or even just looking at optics, like looking at the angles that you often use, or I'm sure we could extrapolate a lot of data from those books. If you would like, yes, they're yeah. just sitting there collecting <laughs> dust. <laughs> so you were you were more. cutting you were cutting on an MDR. So what was the actual process of of apprenticing? Because I haven't really met anyone who's apprenticed in America properly before. I've met a lot of apprentices from Europe. So how did they yeah, actually well, teach? He didn't have a an apprenticeship program set up. You know, he taught classes, so he brought me in. Before class and after class, I had to work on maintaining the equipment, learning to cab, which was not included in the faceting class, but, you know, it's preforming and it's a start. And if you're going to be a professional cutter, you know, cabbing is important. And the professional cutting community at that time was the U.S. Faceters Guild, pretty much, and people with the... I'm, I, I've joined them for a couple of years, but in my eyes, they do the same cut on quartz over and over and over again. Now, now I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of people that get up in arms and 
but I'm just used to cutting different things and I'm not used to cutting other people's patterns. My, my teacher wrote those books, the MDR book of gem cuts, one, two, and mm. three, and he was writing book two and three when I was having my apprenticeship. So I helped him with those. Wow. I didn't get to design the actual cuts because I was still a student, but um, yeah, so I helped write those books and uh, you know, I had to learn to maintain the equipment and you know what happens when you have a room full of students, a different group every day, the stuff gets broken down and it needs maintaining and screws need tightening and transfer blocks. Somehow they get every part on backwards all at once, um, you know, and running the saws. And I eventually worked at Grieger's at the rock shop. So I was there eight hours on the clock and I was working in the cutting lab and selling tools. And then I eventually ended up running their gem department. And uh, so that's pretty well rounded. Yeah, you know, I pretty had much had to cover all the bases. Griegers had a rock shop in Carlsbad where they ran the 24-inch saws and the flat laps and the giant tumblers, and I had to come down and learn how to use that equipment. Mm. So, um, and that was just for my job because the used equipment would come up to Pasadena and then we'd be selling these used saws and I had to know what was going on. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've always been a tool junkie. I worked in bike shops. That's how I, I paid my way through gem cutting school was fixing bikes in L.A., for motocross racers <laughs> and uh, so you know I'm always about building my own tools all my carving tools I pretty much designed myself you know I start with a real machine that someone else made I made my own calving machine for a giant moss sit sit project I had at one time I took an old aquarium stand and a huge half horsepower motor and that thing will take your arm off if you aren't careful uh, <laughs> but I always cab on let's see on flat laps I've never used a vertical grinder. I have no interest in vertical grinders. You know, my first cabbing was all done on my MDR. I made little wooden laps with a hole in the middle and put my polishing pads on wooden laps because I yeah. only had one machine. You know, so, I was riding my bicycle to in class. Well, that's a good way. That's, that's how, actually, that's oh. how, exactly how I was doing it too. I was going to the club in San Francisco and I was in biking distance from there. So every day before and after work, I'd bike over there and uh yeah same thing bikes and i wonder if there's a lot of bike rider gem cutters this is a i never thought there that actually, i don't know if don Lawfer's on here but he's been a professional cutter a friend of mine since i met him in 1979 on a bike ride and he was working in a bike shop while he went to gia so i think there's a strong link i was riding my bike from pasadena to eagle rock at 10 o'clock at night to get home from class until my teacher found out then he started driving me but um you know, I was all about getting the job done. I didn't care. Yeah. So then if you, if you were learning from, you know, from, from your teacher and a lot of, and I think from a lot of American cutters, they learn through patterns, but then they kind of stick with patterns. So how did you transition into kind of going into the direction of cutting for the stone? Well, we had to cut, 10 stones from the book of varying hardnesses to pass our test. And when I did that, then he says, now you need to learn to cut. And then he taught me to cut off the patterns. And then he'd bring in, you know, this was like 1977 and he'd bring in a 10 carat piece of Savorite rough. And Griegers had a whole case full of this blue stone in 1976, five. And John Grieger goes, well, I get involved in this thing in Tanzania, this whole, the government came in and they stole all my bulldozers and all I ended up was a bag of this blue stuff that no one will buy. And it was these huge chunks of Tanzanite sitting in a cabinet wow. that no one would buy. And then he eventually sold the company and that stuff disappeared. And, um, but he was involved in the original exploration of uh, Tanzanite okay. before Tiffany got involved and popularized it or anything. He had, he had, we had cut stones in the gem room, hundreds of them of little brown zoocytes. And I actually had a boss for a while that would sit there with a big lighter and heat treat them. And every fourth one would turn blue and three would crack and with a big lighter, he was heat treating these zoocytes and going, he doesn't know this, but this is actually Tanzanite. This was very early in the Tanzanite days. Wow, so, so no so one knew, no one really knew what it was yet. No, you know, it didn't even have a name. Wow. It was zoocyte, but eh right yeah wow so you started no, cutting the... so you started cutting more in a professional way more cutting for the stone you know the design the after, stone... after i graduated from 
the trade school, then he taught me the real cutting. And that's when I ended up going to Max Schuster, which was all about repairs, which is not about the chart because the guy who cut it in the first place didn't have a chart. Yeah. You know, most, most repairs at that time, at least were, you know, commercial native cut stones and you had to find the facet and fix it the best way, you know, in the best yield to usually get back in the same mounting. So that, that's a whole new skill set repairs. And yeah. I did that for years and years. And downtown LA at that time, there was this guy named Jose downstairs that would cut anything for 10 bucks. There was me. And then across the road at the 607 building, there was Cookie Kazanjian. And we were like the only three cutters down there. Andrew Sorosi had a guy that would cab on his staff. But um, this was this was early days. Yeah. And it's funny because probably if you go back, if you go to LA now, there's probably still three gem cutters there. There's, right, there's cookies still, still cutting. Yeah. Okay. I know one of my <laughs> students has, a, he works in a jewelry shop, but he's upstairs cutting for them or, or cutting for himself in their building. But so yeah, I know there's a few. But yeah, and they're tucked away because cutting for the trade is a thankless proposition. Just ask Tom Schneider. He, he takes in all the trade work in San Diego and you know, I was the last good repair person in the area and I still do repairs, but only for one client. So if you need a repair, you have to send it to Poly International, a little bit of product placement. But, um, you know, there's t repairs are very time consuming and lucrative. I could open a shop down downtown LA and get rich doing repairs, but yeah, oh, would I be happy? No. Yeah. Would I be carving? No. No, but, you, but there is so a ton of work and, and for recuts as well. So there's just so many stones that can be recut. I had a gentleman who flew in from New York with a over 10 carat uh, cashmere sapphire last year. He needed recut and he did homework for about six months and interviewed cutters and he ended up flying here to Rainbow, California and having me recut his stone. And we, we had a great, great um uh, meeting and he wanted to be involved he was a diamond cutter he wanted to be involved in every single facet i put on that stone and i was the only cutter that he trusted to do the work right that would let him do that so mm. it worked out we had a, we had a really nice meeting and he was super happy with his sapphire and a 10 carat unheated cashmere is a pretty nice stone yeah, yeah. so do you do a lot of recuts now or are you mostly from rough I only do important recuts, as I said, you have to run it through Paul International. You know, I did three last month for them, you know, a, ten, a nine carat sapphire, a 24 carat rubellite. You know, I do important stones, Yeah. you know, and a four carat blue zircon because the client, the client was, wanted it, you know, because they have a retail store and you have to offer certain services when you have a retail store. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I only do repairs for them because I am just so over grandma's amethyst you know <laughs> you know, find someone else to fix it so then once you once you decided to go into business for yourself as a professional cutter what was the experience like for you at that time well there's a certain amount of risk in cutting people's stones you know and and so i had to become very risk aversive and so I'm still learning the risk aversive process, you know, because you're working on something else. You spend so much, you know, this, you spend so much time explaining to the client what's going to happen. You spend as much time talking about it as you do doing the work. And so I'm trying to minimize the client interactions and maximize the amount of time working is kind of my plan. And um, the only way to do that is limit the number of clients, quit working retail only work with people who have already screened their clients that are taking the risk because, you know, if you're doing a repair, the stone is already damaged. Okay. Let's start out on that premise. People aren't, you know, willing to, well, my God, you lost 60 points. Yeah. There was a huge chip in the crown of your stone. I told you I was going to lose a carrot. You lost 60 points. You know, it's just a, so much politics. I don't like it. So, I only work through people that deal with the clients, but I used to have a waiver, you know, someone's blue topaz cleaved. And so I had a waiver printed up that a lawyer okayed and said, this really won't hold water in court, but at least you got something up front, you know, and all those steps you have to take to cut other people's stones. And so it just, you know, there's so many obstructions in doing actually good work that it yeah. just dragged me home. So, well, you know, I work for... 
you're still here though, so it didn't drag you down too much, I guess. Well, is what else am I gonna do? Fix bikes? Yeah. <laughs> it's hard Maybe. on your hands. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still fix bikes. I made bikes. I actually worked in a frame shop and made bikes for a couple of years in the 80s and cut stones at night. Um, I still like bikes. I still ride the track. I've had a lot of physical setbacks and my riding is the only thing that keeps me walking. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I still I the Velodrome two weeks ago. They finally reopened it from COVID. So you're and back it was in nice. the... Yeah, awesome. back in the saddle, so to speak. Yeah. And then so at some point then you were pro for a while or for a long while and then you decided it was time to start doing carving. So how was the, what was that journey like to self to self teach? Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> so much self confidence. This is so great. It's beautiful. It's awesome, you know, and then 6 months later you look at it and go, "Ooh." Um, you know, the tools I I had a a, a Fordham flex shaft. Mm -hmm. And I've mounted it on a bench vise and I'm pushing the pedal to carve, you know, because I, I, I did all the research. I talked to a very important American carver named Steve Walters, who's an old cycling friend of mine from the 70s. And he's one of the most important carvers in America. And uh, he assured me that I needed to use a fixed arbor. And I had looked at the German work and I'd looked at everybody who's um, cutting and I decided I needed to use a fixed arbor. I wasn't interested in any flex shaft carving or Dremel carving. So I, I hooked up the flex shaft and honest to God, I melted the bottom of my tennis shoe by pushing that, that foot pedal for so long, two or three hours at a time. And all of a sudden my shoe is smoking. And so then I had to step <laughs> up on the equipment. <laughs> and I have an old Griffin 10 and one lapidary. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I bought it in 1976 from the MDR Corporation actually bought this machine. It, I'll show you, but it, it's on wing nuts and the base folds. It's got a really nice third horsepower motor, variable speed, reversible, and you can make a faceting machine, a saw, a cabbing machine. I did a lot of cabbing on it and you can turn it into a horizontal fixed arbor carving machine. It comes with the Jacobs chuck, but as my technological needs and education improved i bought a really nice keyless jacobs chuck that cost about 400 bucks for that thing and i'm in carving heaven i have a gallon of water with gravity feed and that's i do all my actual carving with that that machine and i polish on a fordham bench lathe but they're modified i put them on a stand i i change this and that about them to modify them to my own but i am big on comfort i put my elbows on a custom cut boogie board with memory foam on top of it um, and I'm able to work long, long hours at a time, which is the only way to get anything done in this business. Yeah, yeah. So what do you think in, in terms of, because I know we were speaking about this before, before the talk started, you know, like certain people, it seems like their mentality is, is, is really suitable for gem cutting. So what do you think for you, you know, when you were learning and then when was that moment when you realized like this was your thing, when it was going to be your life? around gym around uh, probably during or after my very first faceted stone i'm like i can't wait to get better at this i can this is opening my things in my mind that i can understand and i can learn and i can improve at this and um i i've, I've just got to keep doing it kind of yeah this is and now I've got this vision where I'm going on beyond everything I've always done and anything that's ever been written about or done before. And I, I think I'm getting there, but you know, as I told someone, you don't just get on the train, you have to buy your ticket and you have to pay for it. And so I'm trying to get on this train and I can see the train. And meanwhile, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, there's no guidebook on how to be a good carver. You just got to start carving and yeah, your work, it'll either improve or it won't. And the faceting was really my thing because you know my, my brain now works in 96 increments in 96. Um, I'm a 96 index kind of gal, I, I don't change it. I recently sold my 120 after not using it for 40 years. Um, <laughs> someone on Facebook wanted an MDR 120 index gear and I'm like, I got one, I paid 35 bucks for it, you can have it. And blew his mind, but um, <laughs> I had it for 40 years. I'd never even put it on the machine. Yeah. Uh, Ninety-six in my brain. I'm a counter. You know, when I was little, we'd go on a road trip and I'd count telephone poles, right, fence posts, and 
I count, and when I count, when I'm faceting, it you know works out really well, right? I mean, you must count all, all faceters to a certain amount of counting. Yeah. And now I'm carving, and there's no counting involved, but it's like my counting has got curves now, kind of. So then, but I found how session. different how different is the creative inspiration from you know from faceting where you where you are doing a lot of counting and there's patterns versus your carving, which is a lot more abstract and fluid and you know where do you get the ideas from for the card well the you know with a faceted stone you look at the piece of rough and you got like four priorities color shape size and orientation as far as cleavages and cracks and what have you and so you make those calls you cut the stone you know but the creative work is pretty much done by the time you table the stone mm -hmm. i mean there you've made all your choices i table the stone i dop it on the table i cut the girdle i cut the pavilion so you that's where the creative stuff pretty much ends for me you know then it's all the the drudge work of polishing it and then you get a little bit more in the crown but on a carved stone once again the stone writes the script i take a piece of rough say this piece this is a pink tourmaline can you mm -hmm. see it yeah it's a play of tourmaline so i had a big slab of tourmaline and so i chased the cracks and everywhere i see a crack or a line i put one of my design motifs which are lines and so i carve the crack out and then i turn it into something i turn it see here's this is a bicolored magnesio axonite and you can see the crystal striae i didn't polish the sides and i left the crystal shape so once again i follow the lines i follow the cracks and that tells you what happens with the stone you know you don't have a lot of choices because unless you're working with flawless rough if you're working with flawless rough then you design the cut first say this is an aquamarine all right that one i actually faceted first and i designed the rough optically and physically as a faceted stone and then i carved i carved it in there were a few flaws i chased the flaws Mm -hmm. So I have an almost flawless faceted aquamarine. It's 50 carats some, and it actually has, it will fit, it will drop right into a faceted mounting. So that one, I made the design, most of the design, but then the actual curves and art part are controlled by the rough. Okay. And then, you know, then spend about 14 hours polishing it. But so in the carving, the design is, driven by what's in the rough this is a bicolored magnesio axonite and it has all the little striae on the purple end and so that became father winter's beard see it's okay. father it's father winter and it's it's very interesting it has magnesium crystals in the top colorless part so it's actually tricolored magnesio axonite and you can see the axonite crystal once the axe shape so yeah. you're working with the rough you're trying to find it's got um parts on the back you're trying to find something that works that's pleasing to the eye that disguises as many flaws as possible and says something to the viewer and so there's a lot of challenges going on these guys I'm working on I'm combining faceting and carving together now I won a spectrum with that about four years ago with my rooster piece this is a rooster it's a faceted okay. Color change pyro, but if you see, it's the rooster's head. Yeah. Thank you, Des. Um, I didn't know it was a rooster until Des told me. But um, <laughs> this got a spectrum in carving, but I actually entered it in um, the faceting category, the uh, innovative faceting category, because it's faceted yeah. and hand carved. And so that's what I'm doing. Is this light? No, yeah. not at all. Um, well, we can see so it, that's right? what I'm doing and carving smaller rough that's not completely flawless because when you're at my level people expect you to cut flawless stones and then you end up with a lot of very expensive stones you know if you're mm -hmm. going to cut flawless rough it's expensive okay your time's only worth worth cutting flawless stones you create this you know ever increasing need for flawless rough and so i buy flawed rough and carve it and it makes me much happier all these little stones still deserve a life and these are faceted, so they're not going to be as expensive. I sell them per carat, and they'll all drop right into a mounting. So they have the geometry, and it's it's my answer to the concave faceting. I'm just doing it freehand because I just don't need another machine. Yeah. Um, if I bought a concave faceter, I'd be obsessed with that, and all my other work would fall by the wayside. So I'm 
putting my fastening and my carving together in my own kind of peculiar way. <laughs> yeah. And so whenever you're c combining it like that, do you usually just carve the pavilion side or you carve both sides depending on the design? It depends on the rough. Yeah, I'll do both. Um, I have some, you know, if the flaws or the cracks come up, oh, here's one, come up and over the crown. Here's an ametrine. Okay, I'm working on this. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yeah. Should I turn the light? You might you be able to get, okay? see if you can get really close. Maybe it will st stay in focus. Is that, how's that? Uh, move it to the right a little bit. We're just, my yeah, right. Yeah, there you go. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. okay. It's a little blurry, but we can see it better a little bit. Anyway, this one had a few flaws, and uh, oh, there's a giant dog that wants some attention. Hi, Lily. <laughs> this is my security system. He, he, wanted, he <laughs> wanted to be on the webinar, That's, too. Yeah, she's lonely. Um, so anyway, this one, I carved the heck out of it. I have a, a flower and leaf motif. And it had a couple of fingerprints that I cut out. And then I worked orienting the colors to blend into an interesting color because I, I work a lot with uh, unheated tans tonight. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is completely carved. And as soon as I get all the carving part polished, which I'm still working on, then I'm gonna put the facets back on. And okay. then it'll be partially carved and partially faceted. It'll drop right into a mounting. Um, I was gonna put this in spectrum, but it didn't get done. and. I'm working on one single epic piece I'm going to put in this year okay. if I get it done. It's so epic. I'm, I'm hoping it'll get done. Um, but anyway, that's my, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Um, so what do you think coming from the, the uh, point of view of the, because you were saying that you were, you were in the U S fasteners guild for a while and, and doing, you know, they're d focused a lot on year actually. Yeah. And so what, what do you think in terms of, I guess I want to say like advice or just ideas for people that are maybe cutting competition stones or just, just learning and cutting, but maybe want to do a little bit more in the professional world. What do you need to know to transition into actually getting stuff jewelry ready, you know, cutting stones for them to be ready for jewelry, the jewelry industry? Well, I don't think anyone should ever turn down any source of information and something they're trying to learn. You know, if there's an amateur group that doesn't meet all their needs, they're still going to have something to offer. As far as getting stuff ready for jewelry, you need to understand what jewelry needs. You know, it needs a stone that can be set, you know, so you talk to jewelers, look at what is in jewelry. Um, you know, there are so many forums out there anymore. Yeah. Um, there's just places to look. There's books to read. You know, the Vargas books are always good information. Sinkanka's gem cutting is only, what, 60 years old now? But, um, you know, my copy of that has, is dog-eared and burnt, you know, from when I was cutting, you know, when you're cutting for someone in their shop, they hand you whatever and you've got to fix it. How do you, how do you polish um, tuktopite or, or pustite or something incredibly rare? Well, you know, John could tell you. So, you know, there's resources new and old and the internet is crazy rich with information. Yeah. Um, most cutters are willing to share. I mean, I just don't have time to respond. I haven't been on Facebook in a year and a half. I just don't have time for that stuff. But if someone reaches out to me personally, I respond. I, you know, um, not everyone gets invited to my house, but I try to help, and when I'm at the club, I make this known. I'm a volunteer, and every other Thursday, I'm at Fallbrook Gem and Mineral Society when we're not having a pandemic, and my time is free, and you can come in, and you can ask questions, and you know, I, I still have to run the class, but I, I will touch things up or fix things for you or find a student to help you out. Um, I believe in helping people, um, and there's always another question to ask, and every stone that you cut can always be better, so... I mean, no matter who you are, yeah. um, it can always be better. So, you know, I reach out, you know, I've spent a lot of time before the internet doing my homework, you know, getting, getting hold of Germans, Gerhard Becker, you know, people that actually carved. Gerhard mm -hmm. told me I'd never be a carver because I, you know, women can't work that hard, basically, is what he said. Wow. Women can't do that. Okay, so you can fast it, but this is hard work, this carving. 
Okay. That's crazy because I, I, I met a really amazing cameo carver woman in EDAR and she blew my mind. I mean, she was, gem she was doing like not portraits. Yeah, gem cutting is not gender specific. You know, it's no harder than running a freaking sewing machine, really. If you can cook and clean and sew, you can pass it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, you know, the, I took, hopefully I took gender out of my profession decades ago, just by refusing to acknowledge it. Um, you know, sometimes you got to walk away from a situation that's tragically uncorrectable, <laughs> but um, yeah. for the most part, it's like, yeah, we aren't doing male, female gender stuff. We're just cutting stones, you know, yeah. the stones don't care. Have you had a lot of experiences like that with customers or, or you know, people in, in your... Well, not more than one with each customer, right? <laughs> <laughs> I had a guy that came into the Gem and Mineral Club and I was working on the machine and he came in, new guy, and he took a wrench out of my hand. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have to say much. I just turned around and looked at him and said, don't ever do that again. <laughs> I took the wrench back and he left. <laughs> Okay. So you, you know, yeah, you know, you've been into it and, and you know, I don't want to stereotype, but certain cultures are much more misogynistic than other cultures. And I pretty much won everyone over. I got the chops and it doesn't matter if I'm a girl. Yeah. So yeah, no, yeah you, know, you don't you don't win the battle by focusing on the details. You win the battle by being by doing what you need to do. And yeah you know, living by example, I think. And I mean, I think uh, in my experience and in my travels, there are so many women gem cutters. I mean, even I'm, I'm you know, I'm building up a list of who yeah. I want to talk to for this series. And I'm like, wow, it's, it's, it's a, almost half women. And when you look around in, in Thailand, you know, where I'm at, looking at the cutting industry, like it's predominantly women, you know. It, it's a strong. Every factory yeah, well, you is know, almost half and half. In the in the 70s and 80s, you know, it's been growing the feminism movement, but there have always been women gem artists, you know, I, once again, if I start, you know, saying Justina DeVries and all these people from way back that were women cutters, and I'm going to leave someone out. But, um, you know, there have always been important women cutters, and there has always been hobbyists, but um, working as a profession as women has built up you know more women work for a living now than they did in the 70s and 80s you know it's they all you know marry a gem cutter and you can wear a lot of jewelry rather than marry a gem cutter and you could learn a killer trade yeah. um right yeah yeah you make a lot of jewelry so, right make your own jewelry <laughs> think about that you don't have to wait <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh somebody had asked i, I want to ask this before it, goes up in the chat and I don't find it again. When you were talking about, um, you know, your carvings dropping into settings, um, how does that work? You, you're, you're making sure that it has a girdle that's actually something that can be I set? Cut stone, I, fa I facet the stone, like this is a rotolite garnet. I facet okay. the pavilion, I cut it to close to 40 degrees. So I have the optics, I have the entire girdle faceted. And so then I carve it in and after the carving's polished, I put the facets back in and polish it. So it would drop right into a mounting and the crown angle okay. is very important when you're doing this. You know, the temptation is to carve a very tall and important crown because you have the material and you can, but that ruins the optics. You have to keep the angle below in my eyes about 35 degrees. So I cut in a row of facets at 30 to 35 degrees. And then I continue whatever carving I feel like over onto the crown like this one had a very shallow pavilion. And that, that's an idea I stole from, well, initially Dale and Hargrave, but the entire concave faceting is you make a series of Vs on the pavilion of the stone and each one has reflects light at the critical angle. So that's what I'm doing. I've calibrated my hands to carve it 40 to 45 degrees on the, on the curves. And when you flip it, then you have isolated single pavilions that are reflecting light back. And so, um, but physically, if you made a, a regular basket setting for this outer dimension, the stone would drop right in. You could push a couple prongs on it and it'd be wearable. Okay. So, so I try to combine. 
so you're really using the fast you you're putting the facets on really just to guide where optically you know ri wise you're guiding yeah. your what where you're going to go with the carving so you might totally right, eradicate yes. the the facets in the end but it's a starting point on some pieces i do completely eradicate them and then on others i put them back on wherever they'll go you know like say this aqua ended up with a very shallow area there because i was getting out a great big huge um, fingerprint Mm -hmm. So, but I have those independent pavilions there, but I'll, I'll reinstall the facets all up here, you know, not to determine it's a barrel. So it'll be about 42, 43 degrees. And so that'll set up a pavilion, a faceted pavilion in addition to the carved pavilion. So that's, that's what this whole thing is for me is, is putting the facets back on also like this one is a um, beautiful little indicolite I got from Faroque, mm -hmm. uh, Congo. Um, See, and I just saw a heart shape in there. Yeah. So once it's done, I'll polish those facets back up after I've polished all the carving in. Then I polish the facets back up and it'll drop into a mounting. It'll reflect like a faceted stone, but it'll have those cute little lines in there, which there were giant flaws. You know, it was, it was a beautiful stone. It wasn't quite facet quality, you know, so then the price is a little different. And but now this it becomes is a, bike. a one of a kind. Now it's a one of a kind in Dicolite heart, yeah, and it'll be for sale after Spectrum sometime. This is a um, bicolor Congo, red and white, and it had a major flaw. So I buy this rough. I'm like in love with the rough, and I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I'm oh, I'll carve a pendant, and, and then I started this thing, and I have a whole lot of rough that's perfectly ideally suited for this. This is a um, Himalaya tourmaline bicolor. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, it's got a big drill hole all the way through it. And yeah, but the two colors will have separate pavilions. And when you view it, it'll hang on a cord right through that drill hole. Okay. But optically, it should perform like a faceted stone. And the two different colors will reflect separately and they won't blend because I put a V in between the two colors. Wow. So and that your colors gonna almost be like a double Q-lit. Yes, Something exactly. Like uh -huh. So crazy. That's cool. Yeah. Something yeah. that you could never do <laughs> in normal faceting. Well, with a concave faceter, you can. That's what yeah. people do. You know, I saw a bicolor, a guy put like three culets and then faceted each one, you know, with not like a whole bunch of facets, but one row with the concave faceter. And you'd look at it and it's like, wow, that's a killer optical effect. Yeah. You know, and it, it just puts regular cut stones in the back of the line. You know, I just think it's, it's a visual that it's a small enough affordable stone, but it's a visual that's awesome. So yeah so starting in the 70s you were on the mdr has now we're what fif almost 50 years later for you oh don't say yeah okay 45 well, well, years I've been. Yeah. so has the technology changed very much for you has the lapse changed are you still using the stuff that you apprenticed with you know what crystallite plated laps i still use them i've i've burned through um Centered wheels, I do not like centered wheels because they change. You have to dress them, you have to keep dressing them. They, they leave a nice finish on the stone, but I do very, very tiny, delicate little facets on my work and a 1200 grit crystallite plated lap is really the standard I go with. Um, I don't always buy crystallite simply because uh, other things turn up. You know, mm -hmm. I'll find something on sale. I, I needed a 600 grit just for general purpose preforming the other day and i bought one from uh, kingsley north their own new product because it was 37 dollars as opposed to 150. and the crystal light lap i'm replacing is 25 years old i have no complaints it's worn out it's a 600. i took it home from paula when i left there because i was still working on their stuff so 25 years later it's a great lap but i bought one for 37 dollars from kingsley north this is interesting it came in, it was plated on both sides. Wow. They just, the whole thing. So I get gonna, you know, even if it lasts a quarter as long for 37 bucks and it's a solid steel disc plated on the disc, which is really the standard of the industry. Toppers are toppers and friends don't let friends cut on toppers. <laughs> but <laughs> I have a double-sided 600 lap. If I take care of it, that's gonna give me years of performance. Yeah. And man, 25 years on a, on a plated lap, I mean, that's really, uh, 
that's really almost you're in the time frame of centered laps at that point. So that's really keeping here, it is right here and it's still good. It's just too worn. It's now yeah. like a 1500 and I use it for that. But this damn lap, see, this is what the backs of crystal light laps used to look like. They haven't looked like this in at least 25 years. Yeah. That, um, that's a yeah, steel? it's a good What? That one's a this steel? One is aluminum. Okay. This is an aluminum one. Yeah. But the steel one. Yeah, and, and it lasted 25 years. But it's a good investment. I was involved in the diamond symposium, the Sinkankis symposium on diamonds a while back, seven years or something. So I did a lot of homework on laps and I learned how to make the copper lap you impregnate yourself. And as you know, I set Rita up with that to take to Estonia because it's replenishable and it's simple. You buy a copper lap for 75 bucks push your own diamond into it and it, it works forever. And I, I recently saw someone that was charging a cutting wheel with a, um, a gear loose crayon with a 600 grit gear loose crayon. And right there, you're cutting forever with minimal investment. You know, you never have to buy another lap that $75 copper wheel, as long as you don't cut a groove into it and keep it flat. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'll use those. I've used other centered laps, but I have a very expensive 600 centered lap. I'd love to trade for some good rough if anyone is interested. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Emails later then about that. Um, well, was, what about but, polishing you know, then? So, so you're using the plated, a lot of plated laps and sometimes the impregnated copper for cutting. What, what about polishing? Has the polishing techno, because obviously we know that laps have changed a lot, even just since the nineties. Has it, oh, has yeah. it changed? Has it changed for you? I mean, polishing, with, with gear loose. You know, and... polishing has completely changed. I'm an old tin and Lindy A kind of gal. I polish everything with tin and Lindy A, but oh, let's see, Lindy went out of business. And now when you get your Illumina A powder, it's not Lindy A. And depending on where you get it, if it's not micronized correctly, it could be anywhere from one micron to two microns. And that doesn't work for me. And, um, Somehow tin laps just quit performing for me. It's like, I, I've been doing this 40 years. Why can't I polish anymore? And so I did some homework and I switched to diamond. And, and you know, before the late, about the 90s is when they started making a, a reliable synthetic diamond grits. And before that carving, everything was all natural diamonds. And polishing with natural diamond is completely different than polishing with synthetic because with synthetic diamond, you can differentiate between the monocrystalline and the polycrystalline powders and so the polycrystalline is known as the friable diamond and that's what you polish with and when you're going to charge a wheel you use the monocrystalline well natural diamond it's all just there and maybe from one source you get more polycrystalline so there was a big mythology you know the diamond from this mine and Lesotho is better than the diamond from this mine in South Africa and it turns out because it had more polycrystalline crystals but okay you know, how do you keep up with something like that? So now I just call up Doug Klein at Eastwind and I go, I need a hundred carats of one micron, half micron and quarter micron polycrystalline and then 50 carats of 600 grit monocrystalline and I get what I want and I use it for what I want. So yeah, it's huge. And then Gear Loose came in and he invented the bat lap, which is pretty much the standard of the industry for polishing anymore and the crayon. That's what I use. I use a hundred thousand crayon on a bat lap on almost everything. I, I had some issues. I have a magic lap that uh, I kick in for the really problem things. You know, sometimes a tourmaline or a garnet or something. And it's a, it's an MDR tin lap which hasn't been made since probably 1985. And I have one, and I have hundred thousand diamond on it. So it's a blend of the old and the new. Hi, Joe. Okay. Um, Joe overslept. We needed to know that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anyway, so the old and the new, I had the tricky tanzanite. I cut a lot of unheated tanzanite and I was polishing one that's heated and all, it's an entire different ball game. The heated tanzanites were a bitch to polish. Yeah. But my magic lap kicks in, but you know, pretty much the only polish I use is, anymore is um, the 100,000 crayon. Okay. On uh, my carvings, I mix my own polishes. Um, I buy diamond powder and I mix it with a, a combination of things. Lily's back. Okay. Hi, Lily. So when you're, do when um, you're doing I, polishing for carvings, 
I knew, I know you're making your own bits and stuff. How does the polishing actually work? You're embedding your mixture into. I don't make my own bits. I, I use crystallite carving bits. Okay. Um, I use the plated carving bits, you know, for finishing. If I'm using a wooden or a felt tool, then I just keep applying the polish to it. But this is my, um, <laughs> this is my polish right now in my cabbing machine, but it's exactly what I would use on my carving machine. And this is a, a hand lotion from Trader Joe's. And then I mix in a bunch of diamond paste and then I put in, or diamond powder, and then I put in some toothpaste for consistency. And it makes okay. it more soluble by water, but the toothpaste makes it sticky enough. It doesn't fly everywhere because anytime hand lotion gets hot, it, it gets too soft and runny. Yeah. So that, and it smells good. So it's hand lotion, toothpaste, and diamond powder. And okay, I use that with is, every grit. This is a strange, I and haven't I heard this combination before. You know, it's trial and error and it really works for me. It sticks enough and it, you can add as much diamond as you want. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't make my own for faceting because the crayon is perfect yeah. and it, it saves a lot of grief just to buy the crayon. What but, were um, you doing before the crayons were around? You were just, oh, you were using Lindy before that. So you didn't, you didn't yeah, really I was, make diamond. I, I was, what was available back then was a crystal light had a bottle of spray and you shake it up it was a diamond based spray and you spray it on your lap and it was not successful and, and I, I learned on a zinc lap and diamond spray on a zinc lap is how you polish sapphires and it was drag it was you know it was not that successful well as diamond progressed you know it became better and then i was trying my own powder and then the crayons became available and th that's all she wrote i just nice. go with the crayons you know, yeah. Gearloose has, a, he's a genius. That's um, true. You know, the bat lap is flippable. You know, you can wear out one side and flip it. So I just replaced mine. I had a dry. What, us. Yeah, Go ahead. sorry. I was just going to say, what, what if you're doing Sapphire? Do you, do you have a different sequence for Sapphire or you can, same thing? Nope. Bat lap. In fact, I have a bat 5T which mm -hmm. is a little bit harder. And I recently did a large nine carat sapphire. It was a two recuts on the pavilion and one on the crown. And I ended up polishing on the bat 5T. I had, my bat lap was so beat up on both sides. I was polishing this rubelite, this giant rubelite and it had a table that was about a mile wide. And I was just not having success. And I went to my classroom, which has been closed for six months. And I stole a lap from there that was an almost new bat lap. And I was able to get a polish. I did six different laps trying to polish that darn table. Wow. But the almost new bat lap did it. So I immediately ordered a brand new bat lap. And so I just broke in a brand new bat lap on my machine. I am so happy. But the 5T <laughs> was the newest lap I had. Only one side of it was beat to crap. So <laughs> I did the sapphire on the 5T. So I like those laps. They're dark. You know, I don't use any of the soft laps. I wouldn't use a greenway or a creamway or a last lap or any of those. I, I look at a stone I can see from across the room when you used one of those. I, and people want them because students can learn to polish easily on them and the impregnated ones. But I just can't get past those rounded facet junctions. Yeah, true. Um... Oh, I just had a question. It just went out of my mind. Um, shoot, I don't even know. Um, never mind. Forget about that. Um, well, maybe why don't you show us? Oh, you somebody had somebody had asked, "Are you still using the MDR?" And maybe I was going to say, maybe why don't you show us your a little bit of your, your you studio mind. now? I'm going to take the phone off the paper towel roll. <laughs> <laughs> Which the viewer to here. There we are. There's my faceting machine. This is the one I use. I bought this in 04. I've upgraded it. Um, I have a new stylus because I wore out the collet on the old stylus and it got real sloppy and I had to put in a couple new set screws and it became an issue. But there's the, my 96 index gear, mm -hmm. which as you can see, is divided into fours instead of threes. Now the Ultratech and the fat Facetron are divided into threes. And so when my mind sees 96, it divides it into fours. And so my students and I have this real disconnect where their high points are exactly opposite of all my high points. If you'll notice, 
I can change my index gear with one hand just like that. Yeah. That's, that's a deal breaker for me. If you need two hands to change the index gear, forget it. I'm not going to use that machine. Um, and there's my protractor. Is a, can we see this? We need more light. My protractor is a direct readout. You calibrate it, you know, field calibrate it with your 45 degree block, right? Yeah. So it doesn't have any gears to wear out. It's easily calibrated. I have a concentric cheater right here where I just dial it right there and it, it rotates the stylus. And I can do that with one hand while faceting, while changing the index and cheating, just like that. It's the old MDR. Yeah, it's funny how just some really you know, small changes make a big difference when you're having to cut a lot of stones or cutting fast or whatever. This one, the old cheater used to be here on the MDR, and now this is just called a field calibration tool, and you use it to align your, your yoke for your, your stylus and your mask. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a compound cheater, and this is a concentric cheater, and this makes all the difference. It's super mm -hmm. nice. You know, if you put a different lap on and it's not quite as flat as your cutting wheel, that's all you have to do. And look, when I let go of my head, it bounces up. Yeah, that's you know how many yeah. stones I've, I've wrecked because I let go of their Ultratech and it went bam. Yeah. <laughs> and so you said you bought that and one in 2004, just, right? Yes. Uh -huh. This is one of the last ones that MDR had. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to ask. When did they start? Because I know they don't make them anymore. So that was one of the last years? Well, the company sold around 05 or 06 the company was sold to someone who never actually made any more of them so okay. i don't know uh you know i could i could reverse engineer and make these but it's a copyrighted design but it's been changed so many times who knows what the actual paperwork says but for my own use if i need a new one i'm just going to have a machinist friend of mine Copy fix it up it. but i have yeah. the biggest box of mdr parts on earth um, and I still have them and, and you know at some point yeah I made well when you bought that one was it still the same owner as the guy that was teaching you all the way back in the 70s? it was his son Bob okay. Livingston Jr. Um, ended up with the company when his father passed in about 92 he ended up with the company and he's a machinist and he's the guy who put the um concentric cheater on and designed that it's a worm gear it's really cool it just rotates your entire stylus but oh, yeah. so this is my shop and i love the machine you know and it could i i don't know you know i don't want to be a, a faceting machine maker but it sure would be nice to make them available to other people i just don't know how to do that yeah but i i find them on ebay and i pretty much snatch up anyone that's in good condition because my students usually like them yeah so I have a lot of cardings here, if anyone wants to see. Yeah, I, I put up a see. forest of my work. Carvings everywhere. I can pick them up individually, but we spent four hours yesterday just cleaning these carvings and putting them in the boxes. And I thought- Maybe just show us a few of your favorite ones, just so we can get an idea up close of what some of those are. Okay, this is- one of my very first carvings. This is Leo. And he is um, Burmese jade. It was the end of a slab that I bought. Look, he's almost transparent in parts. Wow. But, you know, what do you do with a, a giant jade lion that's only <laughs> three millimeters thick? Um, yeah, he's gorgeous. He was actually in um, the wrap magazine this is a um color change garnet that's a heart that's got a what do i get that it's got a faceted top a cab table and a carved pavilion with a heart in it wow i'm trying to get it so you've really combined everything that. into that stone yeah so it's a floating heart in a color change garnet that is really cool. purple if i could have It's more purpley now. Okay, yeah. But this is the color change pyro from Moragoro that I want to spectrum with this, my rooster. It's the same material. That's gorgeous. Yeah, there's a long story involved in those garnets, but um, 
basically Johnson and Johnson bought that bag of garnets for me. <laughs> if that's any way to put it. This is a, a tanzanite that my I call it scarab. It kind of looks like a scarab. It's a 37 carat tanzanite. Uh, so some of the ones you're doing are very much like they're a specific image and then some of them are a little bit more abstract or is everything uh, really I'd say pretty much everything is abstract. Like the name comes afterwards. I call this scarab because okay. it looks like a scarab, right? Yeah. And it's got a drill hole. Most of them have a drill hole to wear immediately. Not all of them because not everyone. This is a, my assistant calls this one seahorse. This is an indicolite. It's 32 carats. Wow. Nice color. Yeah, I could see that being a seahorse. And so, um, yeah. And so, how you know, long... so it's a beautiful piece of rough with some flaws, and then I, I take out the flaws, and they become all these curvy little collection of calves, so to yeah. speak. So, wh what's an average cutting time for one of those one of those sort of medium sized pieces? You know, I do it in steps, and so the whole thing is I don't keep track of my time. That was kind of the goal mm -hmm. in carving and where I could work without worrying about how long it was taking. And I, that's what I do. I just get obsessive about my work and I bury my head in the shop and it's, you know, four days later and I haven't returned any phone calls or answered my mail or brushed my teeth. Um, <laughs> but, so can I relate to that. but I'm thinking like a piece like this is probably 30 hours of work. Okay. So here's one. This is the 1600 karat aquamarine. Wow, that is huge. Who even knows how long that took? So the top, this is a, the top is a flower, a Georgia O'Keeffe flower, and it's all very smooth. But the back is an undersea scene with the sea urchins and starfish. And how's that look? How are we doing here? Let's try that. So I guess it depends on what you want to look at. You can just flip it over. What what mood you're in that day? Yeah, yeah. Well, see, this is a concave faceting. This has the optics of a faceted stone with the crown, yeah. and then the the reflection on the pavilion. Um, yeah. So it depends on what you're displaying. Or, you know, you could use it for candy dish if you were interested. <laughs> um, An exotic see, candy dish. Here. That one is a hand. You see the hand? Hand holding flower. That's a very early carving. Okay. I love the flesh on this material. So I, I, I copied the Germans on that styling. Mm -hmm. And then the real transparent flower like. This was pretty much a copy of German technique with a theme that they would never use. Okay. It was my actual hand. But I don't do realism because Gerhard Becker does, or um, Pat, Patrick uh, Dreyer does realism awesome, you know, and there are people whose realism, it's their thing and they do a wonderful job. And I don't feel you should kind of do realism. If you're gonna do realism, you need to do realism. And I don't do realism, so everything yeah. I do is stylized. These are some faceted stones I had out. These are some more carvings. I only bought 30 of those boxes. I thought it would be enough. So you got to get more now, I guess. So I got to order another 40, yeah, because there's a lot that didn't make it. But so, you know, sometimes I'll pick up something. I had this slab of rose quartz. I go, that sure looks like a heart. And so I just fix the edges and it's actually still the slab. But I just fix the edges and it's got a, so it's a little heart pendant. Um, eh, whatever, right? Yeah. This is so somebody, somebody, I just realized that I had been ignoring the questions. Um, Susan MDY asked, when you're looking, when you're working on those freeform carvings, what's going through your mind as you study the stone? I mean, I know you kind of said you're looking at the inclusions and stuff, but once you get all the inclusions yeah. out, is there an, another inspiration or yeah. is it really like, just... Okay, now, now it's like, yeah, it's like, okay now we've got the inclusions out now what is there it has to be something that 
is pleasing to the eye or recognizable. Like, see, isn't this a cute indicolite with some blue shading? Well, yeah. to me, it's a heart and it has a, um, a drill hole. I don't know if you can see it. There's a hole right in the upper corner of that. So you hang it from a pendant and it becomes a heart. So it becomes, okay, I've got the flaws out. Now, how do I make it into a cohesive statement, artistically speaking, you know, and you've got the different colors. So I made it in this case, the white color became kind of a trailing leaf below the flower theme. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it has to make sense. It doesn't have to be specifically anything. And I, I love doing flowers because there's so much variation available and I can go to the nursery and buy my subjects and nobody complains. And, <laughs> you know, I don't have to have an aquarium full of mice or, or frogs because I'm Patrick Greer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he is excellent. He does beautiful work and I'm not trying to be him. So um, this is how my work goes. This one, I call it Scorpion. It's a little 11 carat Namibian indicolite. And I just kind of had this piece of rough and I said, that's really pretty. Uh, there's no way on earth I could carve that. So I did. <laughs> it's a challenger, challenger right? own. In, in, uh, right. Idea. You know, I'm like, I would get that polished. That little spike thing will break off. See how there's another color at the tip of his little stinger. Yeah. So now I got to find someone that wants it. It's an 11 karat and Dicolite, but. Well, and so know, um, Audrey Hagdorn was asking. One. Where do you sell the stones? You know, you, you said maybe you're going to sell the heart after Spectrum. Where do you, where can people buy them if they want to buy them? They have to come find well, them. I just saw John's note. Um, yeah, well, at, Spec at AGTA in Tucson, my pieces are displayed at the AGTA show in the 3090 booth, 3090 Gems with Brian Lichtenstein. Mm -hmm. He has been more than generous. Um, we all know the real estate at AGTA is about a million dollars a square inch for your case. And he's been very generous to give me a case. Um, but I personally have not been there representing my goods. And, you know, we're trying to work something out and this is here. And now that they're in these trays, I can really do a pretty quick show of anyone that wants to see the stuff. But um, my vendor at Tucson is 3090 gems. And so he can always find me and find, you know what's available and and this year of course tucson's going to be very different than what we've ever had it before that's all i can say nobody really knows right yeah so um i'm on instagram you can get hold of me there everything's for sale it freaking everything i'll take this one right off my neck it's the commander mine 32 <laughs> carat um, term dravite um <laughs> What I found if I wear a piece for six months or so, it really needs repolishing. I actually rub the finish off this amethyst. This is a Rwandan blue flash amethyst and I've been wearing it since Tucson and I rub the polish off the back. Oh, wow. So anything I've been wearing, I will repolish before I sell, I promise. Okay. And so when you're, when you have the rough stone and, and you're maybe at some point deciding whether you're going to facet it or carve it does the does the color and the tone of the stone help that decision like are there some stones that wouldn't really work well for fasting because maybe they're too dark but they might work well for carving yeah as i said people pretty much expect me to cut flawless material so i don't facet anything that isn't just total top end okay. there's no point you know, yeah. why did you cut that flawed up by color? You know, I can buy it for 50 bucks a carat from Taiwan. So I don't bother with anything. So I facet the really good stuff and then I carve everything else. <laughs> and sometimes I even carve the really good stuff. So like this, okay, see this aqua? Our, yeah. San Diego County has the biggest county fair in California and the sixth biggest fair in the U.S. And they have an excellent gem show there, which is run by very good volunteers. And it's a Smithsonian quality display of an entire building with minerals, fossils, cutting. And I enter that every year. I enter several events. I had 14 entries last year. And they, they encourage me to enter. And I'm not entering to beat the local talent. I'm entering to give people to go to the fair something to look at. A million and a half people go to that fair every year. Okay. So th they have a category called stones over 25 carats. So I cut this aqua in the stones over 25 carats. It's got a spiral cut. It's gorgeous. And it's cut from the exact same rough as the one next to it, the carved aqua, right? Mm -hmm. 
air dock well, actually looks a lot cleaner because I'm actually able to attack the flaws. But I only faceted this for the fair, and now I have it, and it didn't okay. win anything because the judge at the fair is um, someone who is a professional cutter who has a job company in downtown LA who knows his stuff. And he's okay. extremely picky about inclusions, and he will mark you down for inclusions in a heartbeat and then say, nice cutting. But, you know, it's a point of award at American judging system. It's how it's judged. And everybody who enters a fair eventually finds out they're judged on clarity. So I entered a flawed stone knowing it would not win anything because it's full of flaws. That's okay. Everyone gets to see a giant 45 karat aquamarine. They never saw one before. It's beautiful. I don't mind the flaws. It doesn't have a blue ribbon. I don't care. Yeah. Someone else got a blue ribbon. I'm awfully happy for them. You know, <laughs> I don't enter the fair to win. I enter the fair to give people something to look at. This is a yeah. test of my garnet. Is that something else? And look then so thing. a lot of these free form ones, those ones are not necessarily going to fit into a setting, right? They're not really meant to. No, no. None of the free forms will. You're on your own with those. Someone's going to have to That's my previous work. Right, but most of them have a drill hole, you know, so okay. you can just wear it on a cord chain like I do, or you can get a jeweler involved and make something really cool. This is a spine from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. This has a, a hole for a drill. You don't get the dispersion you would in a faceted stone, but every so often you turn it and you get the angle with the dispersion looking. But, you know, spine has some flaws, and so I went after the flaws. And, you know, I just have fun with this stuff, and it turns out it's my IRA account now. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so if we if we look at your typical week, are, are you doing, are the, are the carving stones more for your own, you know, your own journey and your own pleasure, and then you're faceting for work, or is it 50-50? How it goes, yeah. You know, I have a couple faceting projects going for, Look, there's another dog that wants attention. Hi, Glory. I have I have a couple carvings going for clients, but it's extremely difficult to custom carve for clients. You have to have a, a very high level of understanding of each other because the design is always changing and the stone is, it's always getting smaller and they're getting charged for the time you spent making it smaller, Yeah. you know? <laughs> and so the per carat price is going up. This is a... um. Spinel, Mahangi Spinel. So I mostly do my carving on my own. Like I said, as I said, I don't like having to run a stopwatch when I'm working. I do when I'm cutting for other people. I run a stopwatch. I'm expensive. I charge by the minute. Yeah. But um, yeah. when I'm carving, I just really don't like to do that. So I usually don't. And if I'm going to do a custom carving, you know, we agree on a price beforehand or I run the clock and fudge it afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have many projects going, but as I said, I'm working on an epic piece I'm trying to get done for Spectrum. So my faceting and cabbing, I've been doing a lot of cabbing, is for the pay. It's to keep the wolf from the door. Okay. This is a collection of Grandidiorite. Wow. I love Grandidiorite. And, you know, people don't want to even talk about it unless it looks like Paraiba is bill larson said they want flawless but it's a beautiful material to work with i love it it's about a seven in hardness and it has that kind of crosshatch growth pattern mm -hmm. which actually the more you polish it the more it disappears but it is not a stability issue it, you can work with it it doesn't crack or anything it's about like working with an emerald okay which is a lot more stable than people think actually emeralds are easy to work with yeah but um so i just do all this stuff and i have this little menagerie of you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of beautiful gemstones that have all been improved and I, I have no clue what to do with them, but they're all for sale. And I just keep making them because I just am driven. Yeah. Yeah. So going back, to, going back to the faceted stones, um, Jessica White had asked early on, because uh, you were talking about cutting without a diagram as real cutting, you know, when you were talking about your apprenticeship and stuff. And so she was asking for, for the people who've learned with diagrams, uh, how should they go through the transition of, of kind of learning how to cut without the diagram? And, you know, other than just knowing the correct angles, you know, do you have any advice for kind of 
basically building the diagram what as you go. Say, what I would say is, yes, yeah, start from scratch with a, something that's not hard to work with, you know, like a garnet or an aqua and tourmaline and just start doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, set up your girdle. The way I cut, table it, dop it on the table, set up your girdle. And then just find out where the stone wants to go. And you keep in your mind the critical angle. Okay, I don't want to go below 40 degrees or whatever. And then just think about building it up yourself from the girdle to 40 degrees. How am I going to get there? Do I want a lot of depth around the girdle? Is there material for it? If I do, that's what will you know influence your color and add weight to the stone. So let's yeah. think about that. You know, and then you move up and okay, there's a flaw here. So in order to get that flaw out and not go below my 40 degrees, I'm going to have to have very, very long culet facets. Okay, we're going to have long culet facets, but there's room for some decoration around the girdle. So, you, you know, your first one's going to be basic and then you just keep going and, and you try this and try that. And, so and for, for you know, and you'll come out with a usable gem every time and it'll be yeah. different and you'll learn. And so when you're building up your patterns, are you doing more brilliant styles or step cut styles or what do you tend to do? Mixed. I, I do very few step cuts because they just don't make the stone sparkle. You know, if it's a piece of rough or a client that demands a step cut, I'll do a step cut or, you know, if I'm doing an emerald cut. But for the most part, you know, depending on the stone, I, I start with a deep angle around the girdle, you know, 60 degrees if the rough you know is there for it mm -hmm. and i rough in a row there and then i start working on the brilliance of the stone and you know ideally your your culet facets should i think on a colored stone extend halfway or more towards the girdle but some stones yeah. you know you might do almost yeah. the portuguese where you have brilliant facets that, that are zigzagging all the way up to the culet like my spiral cut is like that um where there's this isn't it. This is a, this is a very interesting color tourmaline, though, isn't it? It's a Congo. I bought it for carving rough, and it turned out to be clean, so I faceted it. Which is your answer to that question? That okay, so that's how you decide. Something. Yeah, it's the clarity. Well, it's, that's one part. It's almost no color at all. Yeah, it's it's no color. It's no color at all. It's kind of weird. But um, so here is a a spiral cut garnet. So on that one, I know what I'm doing. I've got four rows of facets that start at um, 60 and end at 40. 60, 55, 50, 45, 40. So that's five rows. So it's four or five rows, and I know exactly what they're going to do. And I'm not having trouble getting this in focus for you guys. But So, you know, if it's a cut I've designed, the spiral cut, then I will do that same cut over and over and over, you know. Mm, okay. So. Just essentially you know i'm doing it out of the book but it's out of my book right yeah <laughs> volume six yeah volume 46. <laughs> this is a queen mine tourmaline see and that one is partially carved and partially faceted and the carving comes over the top but the optics and the um, girdle and the pavilion are all facet dimensions okay oh it's i see three yeah. carat some you could put it in an emerald cut mounting and just put two prongs on and it would hold it. Yeah. You know, regular basket pavilion. So another question from Jessica White. She said she was inspired to learn cutting after seeing some of your tourmalines like 25 years ago. And she's asking, do you have advice for faceting in Dicolite and how to prevent the stone from fractures? Yeah, you know, I've cut so many bicolors and, and I worked for Bill Larson who owned the Himalaya mine, right? And they had mm -hmm. little secrets they had developed that they taught me and they're not secrets. They're just things you do. And what it is with indicolites and with any of these very high internal pressure tourmalines is you only cut lengthwise. Your cutting stroke must go lengthwise down the stone. And when you're grinding preforming let's say you're going to table a bicolor you put it on the wheel and the wheel goes straight down the crystal okay. you don't ever cut across okay. the, the a axis and and then when you're doing the ends of course you have to flip it and and do the ends directionally the same 
thing, but that is what keeps bicolors and, and dicolites from fracturing is you're going to release, you're releasing the internal stress, you know, in the form of electricity, you know, tourmaline is piezoelectric, correct? Mm -hmm. So as you strip it with your cutting wheel, you're releasing the electricity and it will release longitudinally. And if you go across a stone, it doesn't release, it just generates more electricity and it creates uh, something that causes the internal stress to fracture in that way. And I, I cut the ends often at times I go curving around the ends instead of a straight on because bicolors want to, what we call nodule, they want to nodule the end out. So I, I do the ends, but the most important thing is not cutting it against the grain. Um, here I have this bicolor I'm working on here. Right here, this is a Nigerian bicolor. And as you see, I put that kind of rounding on the ends because the stone fractures in that way and it wants to turn on the light. So I actually cut it that way, but in order for the light not to transfer end to end on the stone, I keep the end facets above 70 degrees. Okay. That's how you keep the light from the colors from blending on a bicolor is with the tall angles, but see how it looks like a nodule, the actual shape of the crystal. Yeah. But if you cut your lights lengthwise and polish them lengthwise down the crystal, that is what's going to keep them from cracking. Now, some of them are going to crack no matter what, but that is the way that you can cut them that will not cause them to crack, you know, sometimes. Soon. But I, I talked to a Brazilian guy, now this is over 30 years ago, who was cutting, there was a whole bunch of Brazilian green coming out that was very, very piezoelectric and, and cracking a lot. And he, he told me they soldered a copper wire to the actual stone on the dock and they ran a ground wire down the ceiling of their shop and they actually grounded their stones to this wire when they were cutting them and discharged electricity into the ground outside. Wow. And he said it, it really cut down on their breakage so I've, that is that, wild i've never heard that but immediately when i started working at paula they told me this is how you cut bicolors and that's how i cut bicolors and that's how it works and you know they still give me the big ones because i'm the one that doesn't crack them but this you, is what i'm working on for one client so yeah yeah you got see i have colors. over 500 these are Garnets, these four tanzanites all came from one piece of rough. There's a savorite with a combination cut, and this is the big heated tanzanite that I'm still having trouble polishing. So when people give you rough to cut, do they have requests on how it's gonna look or you do your thing and they're happy with that? Both, you know, sometimes they have demands and sometimes they just want the best stone possible but then we talk about it because most people don't want some weird shape you know they don't unless it's you know a red barrel or an alexandrite or something that's a very very rare piece of work yeah but for the most part they want you know, a usable saleable stone they want best possible yield you know they want it all yeah but we <laughs> discuss it See, here's the wheels okay and there's my polishing wheels there these are basically from finest to coarsest. Cabbing wheels are back here. Work I'm working on. So you're doing all the cabs <laughs> this is on my flat shop. wheels. All the cabs on flat wheels. I do all my cabbing. I do all my cabbing on a flat lap. I have no use for a vertical grinder. There's my polishing wheel. Next step is a separate machine just for polishing cabs, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> I just, just set up this cabbing machine after two sides. That's just, a, you just want to do that to save time? I, yeah, so I don't have to clean the shop and put on the polishing wheel and polish. I'm just going to put the polishing wheel is going to be over there, different machine. So I have the wet one. I mm -hmm. love my little water tank. Look at, look at my water <laughs> tank. Is that too cute? <laughs> so I have the wet one and the dry one, and then I don't have to, you know, screw around anytime you don't have to change wheels you're doing better you want to see my carving shop yeah definitely there goes the dog and more security whoops better hide that you can't see that it might go into spectrum uh, <laughs> well 
you know, we're supposed to keep it secret, right? Yeah, I guess. Who so. knows? There could be a spectrum judge listening right now. Yeah. So if you so heard it, this is you my coloring machine. Well, you didn't see it. It wasn't turquoise colored. This is my carving machine, my Griffin pendant one. Those are all my stickers for the 1976. I bought this freaking machine and it has more than paid for itself. I paid $200 for it. Oh, so, motor. so there's my very trick keyless chuck here. One hand tool changing here, just like this. Boom, boom, drill bits gone. It's so cool. Um, it's got limited speed. It only goes up to uh, 3,000 RPM, which is enough for me. Yeah. And then I have, this is my 260 polisher. Mm -hmm. so this is all my, see, I bought a dozen censored carving tools five years ago. I still have them. I don't really like whoops did i just do something uh yeah we we lost you your picture at least okay touch oh, you're, you're back you're back i just here we go all right we're back it was yeah so anyway i don't do centered carving tools they just don't work for me they change shape okay. you know they they last forever but they're only the shape you want for the first 10 minutes <laughs> so i use <laughs> right so I use plated ones. You're not the first and person I that I've heard say ones. that. Well, you know, if you're using centered tools, all you can make is big swoopy shapes. It's not exactly true because, okay, this is my favorite tool. These are dead ones. These are $10 each, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the graveyard of Meg's finances here. Um, <laughs> You know, Patrick Dreyer uses centered tools, but he has a tool maker right down the street and he burns through dozens of tools and he's just on call. He calls a guy and says, bring me 10 more, you know, and his carvings sell for enough that he can do that. Yeah. But, you know, because he does very fine and delicate work with centered tools, but these are all things I'm working on. Okay, so getting you can kind of get an idea of the stages. Yeah, see, this is a moonstone. You know, and I, I'm learning a technique. I practice a technique. I get it done. I put the piece aside. I move on. You know, I work on something more important. So all these are ready to start polishing. This is some of that Maxis aqua that loses its color. So I, it was blue when I started. Now my hand is blue and the stone is white. <laughs> this piece, um, long story on this, but this is part of a piece that got entered in Spectrum about five years ago. The other half um we won't go beyond that this is something else i'm working on a big piece for someone but that may be important next year so we're not going to dwell on it okay. and then i keep track when i'm actually carving for someone i have to keep track of my time and run a time card and so it gets complicated yeah. see these are these are my favorite tool okay in here Mm -hmm. Those are ten dollars, ten to twelve dollars each, and I, you know, in order to work, I have to have them. You know, I have to knock one off and grab another one, and then there are, you know, there are some Chinese tools that are pretty good. I have some. Here's some more stuff I'm working on. See some aqua earrings, match pairs of aqua earrings, right there. In in progress. Giant savorite. Giant savorite. So when you have those ones that are too wide, do you, are you you just waiting until you're in the mood to f to do a polishing day, or you just have other stuff you have to do first? Yeah, but what happens is I you know I start working and I I do the carving as kind of my pencil sketching. You know, I'm figuring out lines and stuff, and then every so often I go, I've got to bring some stuff up to finish. So then I grab a handful and I work them through, and I say I grab ten at this stage then eight make it to the next stage and six make it to the next stage and then I get four done. And so, you know, I'm, I'm always working a batch of them through, but then something becomes more important. And then I have a new piece of rough I wanna try. This is a Hessonite garnet that's almost done with the 260 stage of grit. Wow, so you have so many things wow. that are just in progress. Yeah, and these are the ones that are partially carved that are in progress and aren't even that advanced. 
yeah and then i had buckets of rough because i just come in here and work and i i don't like to come in and say okay i've got to do this for this guy or this for that guy which i do have to do but it's not see there's the stuff that's at the ready to grab if i get bored yeah and that's what happens is you know i come in and i go okay this is my time i don't have any deadlines so i start working on whatever i want to work on you know and then i move stuff forward and then i end up you know with a, a boatload of finished stuff you see my jade bangle yeah that's a nice one too and so i have a boatload of stuff and you know there's always some, in the back of your mind what is that worth what can i sell it for um but you know here i am uh, do you have any more questions yeah yeah so yeah, actually i got a couple questions that someone have emailed me this morning um so the first question this is from don uh mckelvey in london ontario canada and um he was asking about um girdle cutting so he was saying you know the old school way was um the girdle was cut before the pavilion and now the kind of new school way is you do the pavilion then you do the girdle then you know then the crown connects to it so he's wanting to know well maybe just what's your thought at least but why do some cutters promote cutting the girdle first or some people are doing the pavilion first do you think it's dependent on the design or does it matter at all or is it just personal preference i think it's it's your approach to cutting this is my county fair wall of shame <laughs> oh my um it's your pr preference but that's what i've been told is meat point faceting mm -hmm. where there's my other wall of shame my bike racing days mm -hmm. uh where you you cut the culet and then work to the girdle I see absolutely no sense in that at all whatsoever. It's not how I cut, it's not how I teach. There are people that are perfectly good cutters that cut that way, but I just can't see how it would be uh, good for your yield. You know, if you cut the girdle, then you know what you got for girdle. If you got culet, you're only cutting for culet. Yeah. And you've, um, you've lost potential material. So I cut the girdle first, and then if I don't have enough depth for the culet, you know, even with one row of facets, then the girdle comes down some, but the first step is always the girdle. There's my drill. Yeah. I have I, a, this I is my drilling setup. Check this out. This is a sensitive quill. You put your drill on there. There's oh. a bucket of water. This is the most accurate drilling you're ever gonna see. The sensitive quill costs as much as the entire drill press. That's pretty handy though. Yeah, that's, I had a project for the American making electric transducers for bomb testing out of tourmaline slices uh -huh. and i had to pass the iso 9000 uh, specs and i was able to do it with that That's, yeah. um i was able to cut my slices they had to be perfectly parallel to the c-axis they had to have a one millimeter hole exactly in the middle and they had to be within three thousandths on the diameter and the thickness on the slices so i did that and i made a living doing that for a while but anyway, you know, I, I believe Victor Tuzlikov cuts that way with the culet first and the meat point thing. And so a good thinking cutter, it's a successful way to cut. It's not how I learned, it's not how I teach, but there's really no wrong or right. There's no handbook or no red flag, green flag, you know? Yeah. Um, if it works for you, do it, you know? And, and occasionally there's a stone that I will cut that way because of certain needs. It has to be exactly this deep or, you know, for some reason, but it's not my first choice of how to cut. Yeah. And I mean, if you need to do calibrated sizes or match pairs, then cutting the girdle first becomes pretty essential. Hey, hello. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that we haven't you know, really talked about yet was teaching and, and you've sort of mentioned it here and there, but we haven't really spoken so much of the, the fact that you're also, you've been teaching cutters, I think for quite a bit of time now, right? Actually, you know, I, my first students were in the early eighties. Yeah. Like 81, 82. So what's that? 40 years. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a lot of knowledge. I have a lot of experience and I'm not trained as an educator and people who are trained as educators educate better than people who are not theoretically. 
Mm -hmm. So here I am, I have the knowledge, I've charged for lessons, I've had paid students, and there's always an expectation there that you're going to make them as good as you are. And I'm not, I'm going to help them become as good as they can be. Yeah. You know, and there's a big difference, and they may end up way better than me, some, part, some of my students have. Yeah. So that I just don't do well when I'm being paid to teach, so... I teach for free. Okay. I mm -hmm. donate my time. I teach at the Fallbrook Gem and Mineral Society. Do you want me to turn around so you can see me again? Yeah, I guess so. Then you don't have to hold the camera. So. Yeah, I guess so. Then you don't have to. Well, I'm still holding it, but yeah. All right, here we go. Um, so anyway, I volunteer as a teacher, and I've made many great friends, and I've trained some students, and um, I've made some really good friends that way, and a lot of clients, and so that. Um, so anyway, it's, it's great teaching for free because, you know, I'm fulfilling my duty to the community, giving back to my field and nobody can walk away with the expectation that they didn't get their 10 bucks worth. You know, that's the materials charge for my class yeah. and I can teach cutting or faceting. Um, and I'm learning as a teacher I'm working on this phone thing. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't the want to go back band. now. Okay, there it goes. There it goes. I go yeah, straight, you get the crooked me. Um, I, found, I found the same thing. To me, I I was shocked to discover after two years of teaching kind of foundations cutting, how much better you become as a cutter just by doing simple things over and over again through teaching. You suddenly and by by verbalizing the 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 trip of fixing or discovering how to make something actually work, right? Yeah, it's like you're you, discovering you definitely it learn. Yeah. yeah, and you're, you're just by verbalizing it, you often come up with a, another solution for what you're trying to do. Um, sometimes I'll tell, some, I'll tell a student the rote answer to whatever they're trying to conquer, and then right as we're initiating it, something else pops in my mind. I go, wait, no, do it this way, and I've, all of a sudden I've, just synthesize something that that helps me forever you know so students i think are they're great you know you need to do it it's an old skill that's not gonna live if people don't pass it on um i have a new grandson hopefully he'll want to learn to fast it when he's a little more than six weeks old yeah. um <laughs> hi torn um yeah you know teaching is important necessary i have several family members that were real teachers which is why i know i'm not a real teacher but i'm getting better at passing on an instructor i'm, I'm a better instructor than i used to be how's that one yeah no it's fair i mean we hope so right because you're you're after what 30 years of teaching <laughs> 40 <laughs> yeah uh -huh. But well, I know yeah. I know because you had Rita as a student who was a roommate of mine for a while, and I, I've seen a lot of her work, and it's awesome. So I know that you are not a bad teacher because yeah, I've seen some four of weeks of lessons. I think she had about four weeks of lessons, and she moved. You know, she's one of these people that took the knowledge and moved forward with it. Jason, another one of my students, had three lessons on jury rigged equipment, and he's been a professional cutter for ten years. Yeah, and I have a student who's had two carving lessons and I'm encouraging her to enter spectrum because her work is every bit good enough to enter spectrum. And she's had two lessons, but she goes home and works her ass off, you know? Yeah. Well, I was wondering how many over the years, how many of the people that you've taught have ended up becoming professional or sort of semi-professional cutters? Is it just a small bit or is it I a large the, amount? Quite a few. Um, I don't, uh, less than a dozen, but more than six. Yeah. Um, you know that that are doing it for a living or in a very high capacity like that. Yeah. I'd say seven or eight or ten people. That's awesome. Yeah. I think it's so cool. I mean, you know, for me as a gem cutting historian, you know, look thinking about lineages, right? Like uh, apprentice lineages, and now it's like right. n there is now there's a Meg Berry a lineage, you know, and. And then, right. you know, if one of your pro students goes on and teaches, then that's like third generation and already coming from, you know, your teacher from MDR. I'm in the Bob Livingston lineage, yeah. you know, that's my parentage. I think that's and so he cool. learned somebody. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's so cool. 
Um, yeah, I want to come now, you know, when, when COVID's over, I want to come and I want to be part of the, the Megberry lineage too. I want to learn some of your MDR secret tricks and all that. So hopefully uh, once things get uh, a little bit more settled down, uh, we, we had the, the or we can zoom it, Justin. We can yeah, zoom I think, it. You I can think this is a good idea. We should, we should. Now that I have reception in my shop, yeah. you guys don't know what I jump through to get reception in my shop. Anyone who's ever tried to talk to me knows that. Yeah. I well, don't have reception in my shop, and now I do, so I can work and talk at the same time. Yeah. Well, no, because nobody realizes that the outside of your house is literally a bunch of river rocks that are sort of cemented together. It's like a, it's a very anti-Wi-Fi <laughs> anti house, I think. Yeah, and I'm in a canyon between two 3,000-foot mountain peaks, and the transmitter is on the other side of one of those 3,000-foot peaks, and so I'm in a, I'm in a Wi-Fi yeah. shadow. Yeah. The information superhighway goes right outside my door, and there's no off-ramp. Yeah. You know? Well, seriously, okay. there's five people out there. So maybe for and being a gym cutter, it. though, it's good to be in that bubble. Then you're not distracted too much by phone calls and texts and, you know, people wanting to Zoom you. Yeah. Or I have an answer for that. Yeah. It's called the off switch on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe, uh, I think maybe my final question is going to be just, what are your recommendations for new cutters? You know, if somebody's watching right now and maybe they've never touched the machine or they just bought a machine, but they're just learning, how should they, how should they begin? Or, or where should they, where should their aim be? They should just keep working, you know, get rough that you aren't worried about ruining. I had a student that would never actually cut a stone because she's worried about doing it wrong. I go, it cost you 10 bucks. Just do it. I'll give you 10 bucks if you ruin it. You know, just cut stuff you're not worried about ruining and just keep cutting. If you make a mistake, don't go, ah, it's horrible, I made a mistake. Learn how to fix your mistake. That's another skill set. So my advice is just keep working and anytime you hit a roadblock, do some homework, call up, find someone, ask questions, because there should be someone that can help you with that roadblock. And if no one, there's no one to help you, then work on it yourself. You know, just keep trying. If you mess something up, that doesn't mean you're a failure. It means that you have another challenge to become yeah. successful at. And, and just keep working. You know, what I have, I have 200 pieces in progress right now, at least. And a couple hundred that are done. And, you know, I just keep working. And, you know, so I got invented plastic. <laughs> Anyone want to buy a carving? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, just I have you have to believe in yourself. If you're if you think you're gonna be good at it, or even if you're not sure you're gonna be good at it, I wasn't the world's best jump carter and first right away. <laughs> in fact, I probably not in, even yet, but you know what I mean. No one yeah. starts out great. Well, some people come close, but you just keep working. You're yeah. un, you're not gonna get worse. Yeah. If you and just keep mistakes, working and, and the mistakes try are teaching you a lot. <laughs> And when people give you advice, consider the source. You know, if someone tells you, you don't need to polish, 9K pre is fine. Look at their work. Look at it close, you know. Take the advice in perspective. If I tell you 9K polish is fine, look at my work and say, but you didn't stop at 9K. Well, you know, I'm just trying to keep you on, down below my level. You know, maybe who knows what someone's ulterior motive is or their lack of comprehension might be you know so if someone gives you advice look at their actual work and see how it works out for them yeah um and then bear in mind that your own standards are what's important you know if someone tells me you over polish everything i go that's all right because that's what i do rather than oh i'm gonna cut out one step of polishing and make a lot more pieces with my time you know so use Establish your own set of values for your stones. You know, the girdle is not going to fracture. It's going to be a safe girdle. It's going to be this big. It's going to be polished. You know, and, and I have a million rules. You know, the crown angle is not going to be more than 35 degrees. I'm not going to window the stone. You know, and establish your own rules based on your own experience and what looks good to you. And so, and just keep working. Yeah. That's all I can say. That's great advice. Um, there's a few more questions in the from the from the viewers that I'll uh, run through, and I like this question because we didn't speak about it yet. Where do you find this? Is from uh, Steve 
Koresma. He asks, where do you find uh, notch dops for the MDR machine? I don't use notch dops. I don't use key dops. Oh, you the flat Vs. I actually had a friend with a machine shop make me a bunch of V dops. I don't use key dops. This is the Wild West. No angle stops, no key dops, no gem CAD, no digital readout. I just cut the damn stone. Um, <laughs> but I, I find dops on eBay. I find dops in, on Craigslist. We get donated at my club, which that all ends up in the club collection. But I've been collecting dops for 45 years, which is an average of 10 dops a year, apparently, because I have a, almost 500 dops. But I just find them where I find them but I don't use key dops. And so you can get a machine shop if you want key dops. They can just run your existing dops and put a key in them. But um, or they can take my team off. taught me that the key is never as accurate as you can be. And the key limits you. Yeah. You know, if you want to turn it a little bit and the set screws hitting that key, then you're yeah. SOL. I, I just got to, I want to ask you a direct question about that. Or maybe you don't know, but I just I'm got to <laughs> I, I got a machine yesterday in the mail and it has keyed dops. I've never used keyed dops and already I'm, I've cut half of an emerald cut and I flipped it over and I dopped it. And then I was, I didn't use it. I guess this is probably my problem. I didn't use the transfer block. And then I went to put it back in and I was like, Oh wait, how does this work? It's keyed and now it's crooked. You got, you got to have a keyed transfer block and you yeah. got to transfer it keyed. And, um, okay, okay. I got to change my yeah, whole I'm style. Sorry. Brain and do it yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah, because once you lock into a key dop, that's what someone asked me once, but how do you know that it's in the right place for your key? You know, like this stone is on a key dop, so yeah. I just set it up so I ignore the key and the set screw doesn't go near it. Yeah. But how do you do that? I'm like, I don't even try. You know, <laughs> your, your own judgment and your own hands are going to be more accurate than the key. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a basic primitive mechanical device that you know yeah i guess the one, thing, the one thing that i found that was interesting because since i'm using a handpiece normally i'm used to cutting the table first and i still want to do that even with a with a mass machine so the key dop now what i realize it means that well, i can take it out cut the table put it back in i can keep taking it out and putting it back in with the key so that is kind of handy but then i think when i transfer yeah. i won't transfer no. it. with the key it might end up Oh, a tenth of a degree off, and you got to yeah. cheat a little bit. Yeah, you can do that without the key even closer. I yeah. swear. You know, I take it out and do the table and put it back in all the time. I I cut ten stones and then I polish ten pavilions. I take them out and I put them back in. It's just a question of a little bit of care when you put them back in, mm -hmm. and a concentric cheater helps too. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> you know. Um, Roger Crickenberger asks, what machine do you use now? I think we said this already, but we can say it again. Yes, I use my old MDR, and I will always, I think, use an MDR until, until I've invented the MegDR, and then I'll be using that. But um, <laughs> just then you kidding. don't even have to change the name, but, the MegDR. Exactly. Just change my name. Yeah. Change my last name. And then um, um, someone asked this question, but I think we sort of already went over this, was just reviewing the facet laps that you like you kind of already said you're using a bat lap you're using crystallite plated laps uh was there any other ones that you didn't say this is the copper one i made myself and i had a stone that was just not polishing at all and this is the one that didn't scratch it sometimes a plated lap is going to scratch a certain stone and i came back this is um 1200 i write on the backs of my laps when i put them into service what i use on them okay and uh, so the copper worked out really really well it's very smooth it's replenishable for the stone that was scratching on everything else so i i have a you know a, a holster full of laps some of them are really classic this is an old solid copper lap this is actually from I'm not sure where it's from, but it's a hundred grit and it's solid copper. It's mm. quite the beefy piece. But you know, I, I have a, a huge selection of laps, but mostly I, I use the the twelve hundred plated. You know, most of the fine gems I cut, I start right on the twelve hundred plated. 
Yeah. I don't do preforming. I table and I dop and I start cutting. You know, unless there's some really gross thing that needs to come off the edge or something like that, I don't preform. Yeah. And then where, from twelve hundred, where do you go before a, a hundred thousand? Then I polish. Right there, twelve hundred cut, hundred thousand polish. Boom, boom, we're done. Really? No pre-polish, no nothing. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've never. Straight across. I've never heard that before. Okay. Is it is it yeah, slow it, or is it? Pretty, it's okay. It happens. I mean, it's as fast as polishing. If I pre-polished, it would take twice as long because it takes as long to pre-polish, and then pol it takes it. Say it takes an hour to pre-polish and then an hour to polish. It's only going to take an hour and ten minutes to polish without the pre-polish. You know, maybe an hour, an hour and ten. It's it isn't much longer to just go straight to polish. Wow. Okay. And I just cut it right. You know, my points point up. My meets meet when I cut it, and then I polish it, and I'm done. Wow. It's very simple. <laughs> okay. Saves my clients a lot. Do that, that big of a jump, but that's awesome. On any stone, yeah, it's what yeah. I do. I know. I, I would use go straight to Lindy A from twelve hundred. So why not go straight to diamond? It's even harder and it works faster. Yeah. Okay. This is my Harry Potter glasses, by the way. <laughs> I put silk thread over the tape so it wouldn't be as unsightly, but it's the only way I can keep it from sliding down my nose. And okay. the optometrist has been closed for six months and. So I'm used to it now. So. This is a new world problems, I guess. New, <laughs> new, uh, new normal problems. Okay, Meg. Well, yeah. I think we, you have given us definitely all of your secrets. I didn't even uh, mean for you to do that, but thank you. And I feel like well, you've I, given us just a ton of great I, things to think about. Uh, next time I'll wear pants. Oh, just okay. saying. Um, <laughs> just kidding. So let me right. pop up. I know so the last question that somebody had asked again was, where can people buy your stuff? So I'm going to pop up this last screen so people can see your Instagram and, um, and my Instagram. So if you guys aren't following us, you should because we're posting stuff. But yeah, if you want to buy any of the stuff that you saw from Meg, she's got it up. Or not that she has it up on her Instagram, but you can it's message not her. Up. You just have to DM me. You know, I'm, I'm very much not into sales, which is why I'm broke. But have a lot of work um but everything is for sale you just i i have target prices i pretty much target a hundred dollars a carat and fifty dollars a carat on most of my goods um you know it doesn't sound like a lot a few of them are more if the material's really high but even my tanzanite's a hundred a carat okay. so you know many of the chrome tourmalines hundred a carat i mean hello um, yeah, it's like but yeah, you have to DM me and then you have to be patient because, you know, I'm not into memos. I do cash memos, you know, if someone I don't know, if I know you, it's a different story. But yeah, you just have to want to really want my stuff and then you track me down and we'll make it happen. Yeah. Or if people are at the <laughs> Tucson show, they can go to Brian's booth, which you yes. said was uh -huh. 2020. 3090 Gems. Oh, 30, That's 90. the name of the company. Okay. 3090. That's the um, longitude and latitude of New Orleans is 3090. Okay. So that's a kind of a nickname for the city for the people that actually live there. 3090. Okay. I did not know that. So anyway, 3090 gems at AGTA. They will be there this year. I'm still on the fence about whether I'll be going to Tucson or not. I'm just going to wait and see how things look. Yeah. Um, I know for us, so we, anyway, can't, we can't leave Thailand because we can't come back in. So we should leave. Yeah. yeah it's, it's, it's but you don't know what it'll be like six months either. Right. No, but no. we can't expect it to be a lot better. No. So we'll see. It's see still I drive to Tucson. I drive to Tucson so I can make the call whenever I want, you know, yeah. no, for we'll, us, see, I we'll see how spectrum goes and how safe it looks. And yeah, you know. for sure. For sure. Okay. So yeah, if anyone wants to get a hold of Meg, get a hold of her on Instagram, you can try and buy some stuff. I recommend buying some stuff. Those prices are crazy cheap. So yeah, do it. And it's a limited supply. I mean, I'm only going to be able to carve for maybe another 20, 25 years because then I'll be 90. <laughs> um, and my hand might hurt. But, uh, you know, I've only been doing it 20 years. I'll be good in 20, 20 more. So I, I, I hope see, to be good. In yeah, I want to see what it looks like in 20 more years. It's going to be uh, futuristic or or something. Well, it better be or very, very retro, right? Yeah. 
no, I see myself going somewhere with my work and I can't verbalize it. I mean, if we had all day, I could, but I see myself on this peak and I'm nowhere near that peak yet. So I'm going somewhere and hopefully everyone will be impressed when I get there, but most all, mostly me. Yeah, well, that's really um, where it's at, right? Impressing yourself with your own work. I mean, if you can't do that, then you're not doing something right. Put one foot in front of the other. That's all you can keep doing. And, you know, you'll get somewhere. <laughs> you'll get somewhere. Okay, Meg. Well, thank you so, so much. It's been a blast. And um, yeah, this is going to go up on YouTube in a couple of days. And I, I wanted to paste something into the chat. If you guys... This is the first episode of this new series, but of course there was two more series before this. So I'm gonna just post a link to the YouTube playlist that has all the like 25 webinars that we've already done this year uh, with you know me and various other people. And uh, I'm gonna be back on October 11th. I don't know who the guest is yet because I still got a month to figure it out, but someone in another country, it'll be a new country each time. So eventually, yeah. Eventually, I know a great writer in Estonia. You can yeah, do I, yeah, I was just going to say, eventually we're going to get to, to Rita, who, was in a, who is in Estonia and who was Meg's student. So we'll get to kind of re remember, we'll, we'll come back and visit Meg via, uh, <laughs> via Rita at some point, probably before the end of this year. So, okay, well, thanks you, Meg. And thanks to everyone who is out there watching us and, and asking questions and just, you know, generally interacting with us on the internet. Um, especially Thank you, Justin. I'm really honored to have been invited by you to be on your show, and I, I feel like I really got to express myself. Well, I'm happy you're here. You know, the, to me, this is so awesome to have you, especially as the person to kick off the whole show. But for me, it's fun because I remember when I, you know, I was already cutting for a while, and I just went to GIA. And in the GIA course, they have a bunch of interviews with you. And I didn't know who, you, I never heard your name at that time. You were in a cast and you were probably sitting in the right, same, yeah. maybe sitting in the same place. Um, I am, yeah. But with yeah, much I ruptured. They did that day after I ruptured my thumb, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, now I'm just like, wow, it was really, for me, it's come full circle. You know, I felt like that was the beginning of my, my journey coming and learning gemology and, and now okay now i know you and we're doing webinars this is cool so okay i actually had a lady 22nd street show came running up to me and grabbed my arm and goes you're meg berry i recognize your voice from the gia videos <laughs> so yeah now you're double famous you're famous through for gemology students and you're famous for gem cutting carving fans so i used to be famous as a bike racer too back in the day so, so many, that was then. This so is many not. chapters. Okay, <laughs> well, let us let us conclude this evening. And um, Meg, I'll probably see you sooner or later uh, somewhere. Maybe maybe on Zoom again here. If we can do some little private. I'll be here. Sessions and if to you everyone want else. To find me, I'll. Be yeah, we'll find you on Instagram. Thank you. At least. Okay, well, see you guys later. Okay. And catch you next month. I'll post a flyer once I know who it's going to be. And uh, definitely follow Meg and, and check out the, some of the stuff she's doing. And um, we'll see you guys in the future. Stay safe, everybody. Keep wearing Thank your you. masks so that we can all come back to America someday in a safe environment. And, um, and, and don't forget to vote. That too. We need uh, don't forget to vote. Else. We've seen, we need something amazing to happen in November. So, okay. See you, Meg, and see you, everybody else. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Justin, and everybody else. Catch you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.